Okay, here we go, guys. Um, we're in Daniel chapter 3. We're going to cover verses 1 through 18. And I've titled tonight's, because Daniel is so good, uh, it's called, tonight's title is, When Government Becomes God. How many know that's dangerous? And we've seen this in history. We saw it in the last century. Uh, it's very dangerous. But you're going to find it here in Daniel also, in the Babylonian Empire and different empires. Now, there's a Greek Old Testament. It's called the Septuagint. It just means the Old Testament, which is written in Hebrew. They also wrote it in Greek because during the days of Alexander, when Alexander the Great was conquering the whole world, uh, there's a term, I don't know if you've ever heard the term Hellenization. You ever heard that term before? That's the, that's the Greek culture that, was, that they were pushing and spreading all around the Mediterranean area as the Greeks were conquering the world through Alexander the Great. Um, so that's why... Uh, the uh, New Testament's written in Greek because it became the language. Everybody had to speak Greek. And so you have an Old Testament that's written in Greek, translated into Greek called the Septuagint. And in the Septuagint, it gives us something interesting about, um, about the, the story and things we're going we're gonna to read tonight. Um, because in the Septuagint, uh, this statue that we're going to read about tonight, this 90-foot statue, uh, in the Septuagint, it says that Nebuchadnezzar built it in the 18th year of his reign. We know that in the second year of his reign, that Daniel interpreted, gave the dream and the interpretation of the dream different from the statue that Nebuchadnezzar is going to create tonight, but from the dream of the statue with, remember, the head of gold, arms and uh, belly uh, silver, remember, breastplate um, uh, of uh, bronze, and then the, the legs and uh, of iron and the feet and the toes of iron and clay. That that dream was given and interpreted in the second year of his reign. But now in the 18th year, he's going to build this statue that we're going we're gonna to talk about tonight. So 16 years go by. Now just think about that just for a second. This is just an introductory thought for you to take home and contemplate. So who is the head of the statue, the, the gold part? Who is that again? It's Nebuchadnezzar. It's Babylon. He's going to build this statue of gold in chapter 3. We're going to see this in a second. So if 16 years go by since the dream was given and the interpretation of the dream, and you're Nebuchadnezzar, and in 16 years you haven't seen any, um, uh, any of the next uh, Medo-Persian empire to come in represented by the silver. You haven't seen any of the belly of, of bronze, the Greek empire, you haven't seen anything. You're not toppled. You're not overcome. You're still in command. You're still in control of the world. What is the tendency for you to begin to think? It's not going to happen. I'm not going to be overthrown. 16 years go by. I'm still here. So guess what? Nothing going to change. And so maybe that is some of the thinking, and it's just a maybe, some of the thinking in his mind that he's thinking, my kingdom will last forever. And so therefore he embarks in chapter 3, and we're only going to read the, cover the first half. We're not going to get to the part that you really want to get to, I guarantee, about the furnace and the fire and all that stuff. We'll get there next week, okay? But, and so Nebuchadnezzar maybe has that in his mind, my kingdom will last forever. So let's see what he does with that potential thought in his head. Look at chapter 3, verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold, the height of which was 60 cubits, and its width, 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Now, when you read here in verse 1 that it's 60 cubits and then the width is 6 cubits, uh, look up at me for a second. This is why I need both my hands. Um, a cubit is like from, in those days, roughly from your fingertip to your elbow. Roughly 18 inches. And that's kind of how you look at a cubit. And so when you look at 60 cubits, then you do the math, you know that the statue is 90 feet tall or thereabout. You know that the base of it, six, um, what is it, nine cubits wide, it's six cubits wide, it's about nine foot wide base. So you know, this is a really, really big statue. This is not some little, little thing. Uh, and, and by the way, it's covered in gold. That's an interesting thing right there, covered in gold, right? So think about it being covered in gold. Let's go back to the previous dream of the statue and everything. What was the head of gold made out of? I gave it to you. 
It's back. Oh, it's gold. Good. You guys are so smart. <laughs> Who did the head represent? Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. That's right. What part of this statue now in the literal is gold? All of it. What do you deduce from that now? Oh, my kingdom of gold, it's going to last forever, right? I'll never be overthrown. So you kind of can get that feeling that he's getting overconfident about this. And so, you know, I'm going to build this statue, and it's going to be completely of gold. You guys want a sidebar on that? Good, because I'm going to give him no matter what. Um, now, he is building the statue, obviously, the whole thing. The Antichrist is going to come in at some point in our future. And there's going to be, as we go along, there'll be more references to the Antichrist. Trust me, with Daniel. Daniel and Revelation, like, go hand in hand at times. Um, so the Antichrist, when he comes along in the future of our, our world, he's going to be a world dictator. We know that, right? He's going to be a world dictator, and he will also control world. He's going to consolidate religion, and he's going to consolidate and control all religion in the world through a person called the false prophet. And the false prophet, when you read Revelation, he's, um, he's the other beast. Uh, he is a, uh, he's like the counterpart to the Holy Spirit, uh, our Holy Spirit, who's the head of the actual church of the living God. Now, there, this, this false prophet is going to actually create an image. And by the way, the image is going to talk. Can you imagine that? And there's all kinds of speculation you can make on that right there because now we live in the day of, we've been living in the day of, for six years, of television. Everybody can see an image on TV talk, right? So maybe that's one way, and there's been all kinds of speculations what that thing could be. But in Revelation, you're going to find that when this image is made, that people are going to have to worship that image, correct? So now you find here, and we know, those of you who know the book of Daniel, He's now making an image here. And we know that people are going to have to fall down and worship this statue, this 90-foot statue that's covered in gold. And so you're watching something that is, is going to keep on being replayed in history where a, a leader, a dictator, is going to want to be worshipped as God, as deity. You follow me so far? One of the things that tells you is that does Satan have any new plans? No, if they work, they work, Right? And what's weird is in Revelation, when they're worshiping the Antichrist, they're going to worship the Antichrist, and they're going to say, who is like him? And I'm thinking, how could you fall for this stuff? But people fall for this stuff all the time. But fear has a strong play in falling for that, right? To keep people in line. So uh, Nebuchadnezzar builds a statue. It's not just for aesthetics, though it is beautiful, I'm sure. There's a ultimate purpose, and that is worship. So verse 2 says, Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent word, to assemble the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Verse 3. Then the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, say magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces were assembled for the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Now, that sounds like two really boring verses, right? You probably just want to read them, get through them, but you can't do that. Because there's something very important. And some of the things I will say in this book, it may throw you a bit on how you look at this culture and America and the world and everything else. I'm fine with that. But I will stand on what I believe and what this thing says to the day I go to that grave and see Jesus face to face. Amen to that one? Now, he gathers everybody in the empire, everybody who's anyone in the empire, all the uppy-ups, all the high officials, everybody with authority, and he calls these people there, certain ones are called the magistrates. Huh, they're in attendance. What are the magistrates? Who are these people? Let me tell you who they are. They would be like our Supreme Court. They would be like our judges all through the nine circuits and different places. That's who the magistrates are. They are in this crowd, the Supreme Court. Now, in a healthy country, healthy, in a healthy country, there is independence between the political system and the judiciary, right? 
You have to have those things because that keeps checks and balances so that no one can become an authoritative dictator of a country. You follow me? Because once a person gets in power, we know that absolute power absolutely corrupts, correct? And so you got to be careful of those things. So the founders of this great nation, and I believe my nation's the best in the world, now the founders, they set this thing up brilliantly. You could tell that God must have been speaking to them because they've got the checks and they've got the balances in, in this world. Now, he's bringing the magistrates there. He's bringing the judicial system there, and he's going to force them with everyone else to bow to the statue. Now, think of what that means. That's just not like, oh, oh, okay, yeah. No, it's not an okay, yeah. This is something that you'll watch in history. This is government now wanting to become God. They're trying to take over everything and, have, and be the ultimate authority. The problem is when government becomes God and starts to control all these things, all you have to do is look in the last century. Look at Russia. Look at China. Look at Cambodia. Do you guys know what happened in those places? When government becomes God, it is dangerous for the people. It is dangerous for every last one of us in this, in this nation. So you got to be careful with stuff like that. So he brings them there, and they're going to have to bow. Now, in my notes here, I put optional, Jim, which means for me, I have the option at that moment of saying what I'm going to say or not saying what I'm going to say. Did you guys know I put stuff like that in there? I do because sometimes I'm rather feisty. And, and, and the more you push me on an issue that I believe strongly and I can back with scripture, I will, I'll go to battle on it. I'm just going to do it and I'm not going to back off it. It doesn't matter even if my wife says something opposite of Jesus. No, I'm just joking. She might be right. I could be wrong. But, but let me give you an example of this. this. This was sweeping in our country. This thought was sweeping. This idea of government becoming God, the magistrates bow, bowing down. And there's different ways to maneuver in it. And I analyze it. I think I don't just sit there and flippantly say, well, that's, I just think about these things. And, um, but for a while there, and it was during COVID, um, do you remember when they were this this dialogue about expanding the Supreme Court bench was coming into play? Anybody remember that? I thought, oh gosh, that's dangerous. That's dangerous. Now, if you follow, well, their 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 statement, which was a, I'm going, that's an absolute lie. They were saying this that they're doing that because they want to save democracy. No, we already have democracy, and it's a good system. It's a great system. If the only flaws in it is because humans are flawed, the system's really good. But they were saying we want to, we want to, you know, save democracy. I thought that's a complete lie, because the real truth is this: the real truth is now we have a Supreme Court nine on the bench that is uh, five to four conservative, right? Five conservative on the bench for liberal and the liberal don't like that now what was the deeper rooted issue of that I'll tell you what you can say that's not true it's exactly true the reason why they're making it sound cool oh, we're trying to save democracy no they want to keep murdering babies that's what it came down to guys you can say that's not it's exactly true they wanted to keep they wanted to stack the bench get more liberals on there so they could keep abortion in play why do you think so many people got crazy when they struck down Roe versus Wade on the Supreme Court level and gave it back to the states can you imagine living in a country where people are upset because you're going to save babies babies lives it just doesn't make any sense does it does it okay no it doesn't so that was the whole thing. We have a good system. But government tries to become God. You can never let it become God. Now, let's go to verse 4. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, To you the command is given, O peoples, nations, and men of every language, that at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, bagpipe, and all kinds of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that uh, that Nebuchadnezzar, the king has set up. 
But whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. Sound like a fun day? Okay, now, point one in your notes, and that's this. Nebuchadnezzar is making himself the absolute ruler over government and religion. That's what he's doing. He is now going to make himself the absolute ruler over government and all religion follows the Antichrist. So here's what's going on. Can you imagine? They bring in all the they bring in all the singers, they bring in all the musicians, the best that Hollywood has to offer, right? They got everybody there now. The crowd is pumped up, right? They got the highest of all the officials, all the dignitaries in the audience, the cameras panning around, anybody who's anybody is there. And then the herald stands up, and here's what he says, and I'm sure it's been, this is what uh, Nebuchadnezzar told him to say, the herald says this, we read it, let me read it again. He says, at the moment, he's talking to all the people, at the moment you hear the music begin, you are to fall down and worship the image the king has set up. And if you don't worship the image, then into the blazing furnace you go. Whoa. What he just did there is he just said this. I'm the head of state now. I'm the head of religion now. I'm going to snuff out all opposing voters. And I'm going to take over all religion and its false morality. And I'm going to run the show now. That's what he just said. That's exactly what he's doing. If you don't bow, then you die. What does the Antichrist again say? If you don't worship the image, bow, then you what? You're going to die. You find these consistencies all in history. It's also in the future of our planet. Now, let me try to take you back to chapter 1. And now, we're not going to turn there, but just try to remember this if you've been with us. Remember I told you in chapter 1, um, remember when Nebuchadnezzar conquers Jerusalem and he brings the vessels of God. Remember that? He brings the vessels of God out of the temple because there's no statues because Jews don't make an image of God. He brings the vessels. And um, these are holy vessels. He brings them, and he brings them to Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar has kind of like a museum of false gods. And he puts these vessels in his, with, with all the other false gods. That's what he does. And remember the term I used back then uh, w when he did that? I said he relativized the absolute. Remember that? Anybody remember that one? Okay. It just means this. Is God the absolute? And all the false gods, are they all the polytheistic? It's relative, right? They're all there, right? He relative, he made God common with all the other idols. That's what he did. Now, that's what he did. Now, watch, 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 watch. Now, he reverses it. And he says, I'm the absolute. And all these other idols, they're just a bunch of common things. I'm the absolute. Because that image is pointing to him. You're going to find out in a second. It's about him becoming God. Because he's going to make a statement to these guys. He's going to let the cat out of the bag. And so now he reverses the whole thing, the whole process. He says, I'm the absolute now. Now let's move on. Verse 7. Therefore at that time... When all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, bagpipe, and all kinds of music, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king set up. For this reason, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and brought charges against the Jews. Uh-oh. Point two, because here's where it starts getting sticky. <clears throat> um. The power greater than fear is faith. The power greater than fear is faith. Okay? Yeah? Okay. Here's what's going on. Do you think there's a lot of people there? Yeah. The crowd is so big, and when they give the command, it looks like 
it looks like it's a massive success. Everyone has bowed down, right? But is that true? Oh, no, it's not true. Not at all. <clears throat> we know from what it says here, well, as we read on, that there's, that there's guys in the crowd who are in high positions in Nebuchadnezzar's cabinet there. They're watching. And they're watching certain people, specifically certain people. Who are they watching? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Because they're going to see whether these guys bow or not. And they're, you know, they're bowing, but they're watching. And when it all happens, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they don't bow. It's, it, it's like, it's like, it, it's like in, remember the movie Gladiator? Anybody watched that at least 25 times yet? Okay, good. Because I have. <laughs> movie guy but remember that scene where where um, where um, maximus finally gets to the coliseum he's, he's a slave remember he gets there and they're going to go out there and fight and they're supposed to make state make that line make that statement to commodus right who's a caesar and they say we who are about to die salute you and they're out there and and they all say we who are about to die salute you and they salute you know commodus he's supposed to be like god and does maximus say it oh no he just stands there with that cool mask on. Remember the mask? I got to get me one of those and preach in it one day. It's just cool. Oh, it's so cool, man. But he's not going to bow. And that's the same thing that's happening right here with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The music begins. Everybody bows. Can you see them standing there? Not happening, man. I know who you think you are, but not happen. Now, the question, a good question is, who tattles on them? Let me throw a, a possibility. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are part of that group now, the Magi, the magicians, conjurers, all that kind of stuff. They're in those positions. It was probably some of those guys that aren't Jewish. Now think, now think, think, think. Remember... Nebuchadnezzar, when he has the dream of the statue of gold, silver, but remember that? And he tells his magicians and conjurers, interpreters, he says, tell me the dream first, and then tell me the interpretation. And if you don't tell me the dream, what's going to happen to you and your families? You're going to die. And they're panicked, right? Who saves the day? Daniel. Daniel walks in because he knows God, and God tells him, and he goes, here's the dream, here's the interpretation. He saves their lives. Guess who are the people who are betraying the Jewish boys now? Those guys whose lives were saved. Oh, how quick they forget, huh? But really, there's something else probably going on here more than that. It's probably a thirst for power. Because these guys have risen up in power, high position now, because God obviously is, is upon their lives. And so they're trying to get rid of these guys. So they're not going to fall to any fear because everybody there guarantee is bowing because they're afraid for their lives, right? But these guys have faith. Now, uh, I'm running out low on time. Oh my gosh. Uh, but we'll turn there anyway. Turn to Hebrews chapter 11. I've got to get through this. You guys do this to me. It's not my fault. <laughs> this is like a weekly discussion in, in our staff about how long I go on Sundays and stuff like that. Now, just real quick, watch 33 and 34, Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 is, is termed the hall of faith. Now watch verse 33. Who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions. Now watch. Quenched the power of fire. fire. Now, it doesn't give their name, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but you know who they are, right? So he's telling us, the writer of Hebrews, whoever that is, is telling us that these men by faith, quench the power of fire. That, you know, you, you know and I know they're going to walk into that furnace and they're going to quench the power of fire. It's not going to singe them whatsoever. Now, let's turn back. Let's get back to Daniel. I just want to make that point right there. So their, their faith overcomes the fear. Now, chapter 3, verse 9. They responded and said to Nebuchadnezzar, the king, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, bag... I'm tired of reading those terms, okay? <laughs> uh, no, I'm not. Bagpipe and all kinds of music is to fall down and worship the golden image. Verse 10. Verse... No, verse 11. 
But whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. Verse 12, there are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have disregarded you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. Kind of pressure time now, right? Point three, they tell the truth, beginning with a lie. They tell the truth, beginning with a lie. Okay, think about this. They say, they have disregarded you. Question, have they really disregarded him? No, they haven't. They've been on his team the whole time. They've been helping him the whole time. They haven't disregarded him. But then they bring and they say, that's their lie. Now here comes the truth. They don't serve your gods or worship them. Is that true? It's true. So they do tell the truth, but they begin with a lie. And then, watch closely. Where, where is it at? Verse, 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 verse 12. What's the first line of verse 12? The certain what? Oh, now they're playing the ethnicity card. I call it the race card, but I believe in only one race, the human race. So I'll call it the ethnicity card, okay? Because we're all, we all come from the same place. And uh, I always tell you that whoever you're married, no matter who they are, uh, you married a relative, distant, but a relative. Amen. <laughs> so uh, you, if you're new to New Beginnings, that's the first time you hear me say that, you hear me say that so many times that you'll say one point, Jim, I got it, okay. I got it, I got it. But we're all, we're all one race. Now, so they play this ethnicity card. They say these certain Jews. Isn't that society today? Let's throw a little bit of truth in there, and I'm going to throw a bunch of lies, and then we're going to make it all about your ethnicity. That's exactly what happens today. So guess what? Truth doesn't even matter anymore. It really doesn't matter. I watch, and you heard me, sometimes I, watch, so I scream at the TV when I hear you. It's like, I cannot believe people fall for this stuff right here. Now, question, why do these guys lie about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Well, look back at chapter 2, real quick, real quick, and verse 49. It says, and Daniel made request of the king, and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the administration of the province of Babylon while Daniel was at the king's court. Did they get to rise up in power with Daniel? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So they've risen up in power with Daniel. Question, do people like control and power? Yeah. These guys want to get Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego out, out so they can be in the higher power positions. That's what's going on. So that's why a little bit of truth, a lot of lie. Let's play the ethnicity card. Let's do all these things. Let's get everybody sideways so they're not really looking at what really is going on here. And that's what happens today. And it happens all the time. And I, I personally, I'm just so sick of it. Now, sidebar. You guys want a sidebar? Yes. Okay, good. They, uh, they start with a lie about these guys. If you're in a leadership position, get used to being lied about. Anybody know what I mean? Yeah. Get used to it, man. You better develop thick skin if you're going to stay in that position. Because they're going to lie about you. I have been lied about so many times. Sometimes I'm upset because the things they lie about I do wish I had. Can I tell you the, the most ridiculous lie I ever heard about me? And of, of, there's, there's so many. There's so many. You know, this one, this was over 20 years ago. And a um, person was upset. I won't tell you what they're upset about. And, and they left the church. And, like, that hasn't happened to me 200 times in my life. Um, and, and as a leader, if you bend to what everybody wants, you, you're not a leader. You're not a leader. you got to... Stay the course with what God is telling you. But anyway, this person said, some of you have been a long time, a long time, you're going to know who it is, so don't tell anybody who it is. You know, just because they're sitting in the fourth row. Or, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. One, two, three, four. No, I'm uh, no, this person said, it was when we were building the church, they said, they accused my wife and I of taking the tithe money and my wife's name is Olivia, and that Olivia was driving a, anyone remember? She was driving a Lexus. Here's the funny part. 
We didn't have a Lexus. Another woman in the church named Olivia had a Lexus. So I was upset that we didn't have a Lexus. <laughs> even though they accused me of having a Lexus. I go, that's not, that's not, that's not even funny. I, well, then give me a Lexus so you could accuse me. At least if, if I can have one. But that was, that was not, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? So that's just one. There's so many more I can tell you. They're just hilarious. But um, I don't even know where I'm at anymore. You made me go off track here. <laughs> Um, okay, so if you're in a leadership position, people can start to say things about you. It can lead you to want to quit, but don't quit. Because remember who has called you to that position and who you're here for. Okay, remember, you're not here for yourself. You're here for people. And you're here to minister to people. Now, Daniel chapter 3, verse 13, and it says this. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and anger, gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, then these men were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now if you are ready, here it comes again, man. Now if you're ready, at the moment you hear the sound, do I have to say them again? No, here I go. The sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, and bagpipe, and all kinds of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made. Very well. But if you do not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can deliver you out of what? My hand. My hand. Ah, number four. Great point. Nebuchadnezzar lets the truth slip out. He just let the truth slip out right there. We'll, we'll take it. Okay, he says, is it true you don't serve my gods or bow down to my image? Then I'm going to give you one more chance. Okay, guys, one more chance. But then notice he said this. What God can deliver you out of my hand? The point is, there's not a God in the universe that can deliver you out of my hand. What has he just proclaimed about himself? I'm God. I'm God. I'm the all-powerful God. He let the cat out of the bag. He set himself up as God. Now you get the clear picture of why he wants control over everything. Now, here's what's weird. Let's watch kind of a flip-flop of his life. Look back at chapter 2 and verse 46 and 47. This is after Daniel has interpreted the, the previous dream. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and did homage to Daniel and gave orders to present to him an offering and a fragrant incense. The king answered Daniel and said, Surely your God is God of gods and a Lord of lords and a revealer of mysteries since you have been able to reveal this mystery. What did Nebuchadnezzar proclaim after the interpretation of that dream in the last chapter? Daniel's God is what? Is the God. What is now Nebuchadnezzar stating in this chapter to these three guys? I'm the God. He's flipping back and forth. You're watching this whole thing happen in this man's life. He's doing a 180 degree turn. Now, the big problem that's going on here is just a problem of human nature, fallen mankind, can't blame anybody. We've been in that boot, we've, uh, in that shoe. We fall into that shoe periodically. We always got to watch out for it. He made himself what? He's what? He's God. Okay. What was the temptation to Adam and Eve in Genesis 3? Eve, eat the fruit and you'll be a what? You'll be God. Put it simply, we'll deify your opinions. You're the shot caller. Whatever you say, that's what's true. That's the fallen nature. Every one of us is infected with that idea. And we've always got to be careful with it. And so now you see it here. But you see it in corruption, you see it in power grab because they want to be God, and you see it in dialogue about is there truth? Oh no, that's your truth. You know, I have my truth. You see all of it. It has so much, so many uh, tentacles to this idea that I can be a God. Now, he is raging, is he not? He's upset because these three guys have not bowed. He's raging, but he's also self deceived, isn't he? Okay, we'll see that here. Number five, point five in your notes self worship leads to self deception. Self-worship leads to self-deception. Now think. He thinks he is the God of gods. 
Right? Is that a little bit self-deception? Yeah, to think you're the God of God. And everybody's going to bow down to him. He thinks that. They, they, they're not bowing down. He's wrong. And so he is very self-deceived because they're not going to bow. Now, <clears throat> let me see. Yeah, I got time. I got time. I got time. Let me, um, let me just make a quick, quick application for somebody here or somebody's going to watch this later in the week in the snap. It, it, it's none of you guys. You guys look really nice. If you make yourself God, oh, you may not say it, but if you make yourself the center of the universe, don't ever date anyone and don't ever marry anyone because you will make their life hell because it will be all about you and you will have to be right all the time. And you will make that life, that person's life miserable because it's all about you. That's the worst way. We learned on Sunday that the greatest among us is the what? The servant. It's not about you and it's not about me. If you want anything to work, if you want to live at the top potential that God has for you, you become a servant to others. It's not about you. He's making it about him. And people, listen, all the years I've counseled people, this is such a deep-rooted issue. It goes back to Genesis 3. Eve, you will be a God. And then you have the power struggle in relationships, right? Because each one of you can be a God. And that's why you see in Genesis 3, it eventually evolves to a woman's desire shall be for her husband. The word desire means to run after or run over. That's the literal idea of it. And it says, and he will rule over you. Does that sound like they're getting along? Sounds like a power struggle, huh? And that's the power struggle, as you see. In the fallen nature, and only Jesus Christ can turn the nature so that you work as a team, so that you serve each other. Does that make sense? Okay, good. I'm glad because hopefully I said it right. Now, verse 16, 17, 18. Here's where we're going to drive home. Here's where we're going to. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Replied the king, replied, replied to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. Now stop right there. Can you imagine? <laughs> if I'm Nebuchadnezzar, I'm going, I don't know what they're going to say now. What's going on here? Verse 17. Watch, these are some of the greatest words you will ever hear come out of a follower of Yahweh's mouth. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. Here it comes. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. I got a question. Do you think anybody around there is listening to that? Okay, before I get to that, I just want you to think about this because it's really, I think it's really important. You could read that knowing the story. We know the story that they're going to be delivered. We'll get there next time. You could read that and say, oh, God delivers them out of all their problems. They didn't go through any pressure. There was not, 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 nothing like that. You, you'd be wrong. Just think. Just get back into their position now and think about this. Previously, Nebuchadnezzar said, if none of you guys can tell me the dream and interpret the dream, what's going to happen to you and your families? Okay. Now with the statue, if you don't fall and worship it, what's going to happen to you? Okay, now think about that. Let's think about it. Let's back up now, and let's say you're one of these three guys, and you got a family at home, and you got some kids. Maybe they're like teenagers, whatever. And you're sitting around the table, and you know these things are coming. And you know what has to happen. But you know that you are not going to bow. But what if your, fam your family's feeling the pressure? Wouldn't they feel pressure? And what if your family start? what if your teenage kids say, Dad, Dad, just bow. We know you don't mean it. We know you're not really worshiping. We know your heart, just, just, just bow. And then everybody goes to bed that night and they're just like, the pressure that would be terrible, wouldn't it? 
So even though they get delivered, don't think they didn't suffer. Because they had to have suffered thinking about these things. I mean, knowing what you're gonna, what he's going to tell you to do, what you're going, you better do this or this is going to happen. But they're not going to bow. They're not going to bow. So let's see what happens. The verses, you don't have to read them again. I just read them. Now let me, let me see. They say, we don't need to give you an answer because our God is able to deliver us. Question. What did Nebuchadnezzar say about their God or any other God just previously? No God can deliver you out of my hand. They say, our God can deliver us. Can you imagine Nebuchadnezzar? Well, what would you tell me? <laughs> okay. And then they say, he will deliver us. He will deliver us out of your hand. And then comes the biggest statement of all. It's just, he says, but even if he doesn't, we're not bowing. Even if he doesn't, Nebuchadnezzar, just know, and everybody here know, we're not bowing at all. It's not going to happen. What do they just say? What, 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 what's going on? What do they mean by that? Here's what they mean. They're saying, we're not going to pretend to tell God what to do. That's for God to decide in my life. Did you hear what I said? So get off the bandwagon that God's going to deliver you every time. No, you watch some of the greatest of faith in the scriptures. They didn't get delivered. Now, when they say that to Nebuchadnezzar, that renders him, in a sense, powerless, does it not? That probably got him so mad. He he gets him so mad. He can kill them, but he can't force them to bow. I just made everybody bow, but I can't get these three guys to bow. Huh. Now, here's the bigger question, or a bigger question. Why can't he force them to bow? What's the secret? I'll tell you the secret. It's your secret and my secret. These guys know that this life is not all there is, that there's an eternal life. And you better start buying into that truth because that truth will secure you in your foundation in anything you do, knowing that this life is not all there is. He's raging now. He's steamed up. And so now he's going to have them instantly cremated. I'm going to get rid of these three guys, light that fire up. They're going to die now, or so he thinks. And we'll pick that up next week. So let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for, what a great story. It's not just a story, it's, it's reality. God, that these three men had the faith in the midst of fear to not bow because they know where they're going and they know whom they serve and they know who the greater authority is. Thank you, Jesus, for this great example from these men of faith. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen.